Hello everybody. This week what we're going to be taking a look at is Newton's Laws of Motion. So throughout the video, I'd like you to work through it and pause when you are told to. There will be a big sign that comes up like this. If you require any further support, there are video links detailed on the worksheet that accompanies this PowerPoint. Okay, just click on there and they have good explanations of all three laws. So, let's have a little think about it. We know if a football is stationary and you apply a force by kicking it, it moves. It goes in a direction. Think to yourself this one. Does it require more force to push an empty shopping trolley or push a full shopping trolley? Well, we know it takes more force to push the full shopping trolley. And if a car crashes into a wall, applying a force, does the wall apply a force in return? Well, yeah, we know this because if you drive a car into a wall, it's going to damage your car and you're going to get hurt. So these questions are all about what happens when forces are applied to objects. They may seem simple because as human beings, you've been observing these situations like this all of your life. But it's these simple ideas are important to understand how our world and universe works. Now, Isaac Newton, in 1687, he identified and defined the three laws of motion that explain the relationship between objects, forces and motion. So. I'm going to have a quick reminder of uh, stuff we've covered previously. So, force diagrams. We previously learned how to represent forces on a diagram using force arrows. In the picture on the right, where we've got a box on the table, we've got a force uh, representing uh, gravity and a counter force in the opposite of gravity. So, remember, they should always come in pairs and they usually point away from the object. Okay, that is the golden rule of forces, they always come in pairs. Another reminder, we've looked at resultant forces. This is where we just add a little bit of mass to it. Uh, this is what you get when you add up all of the individual forces acting on an object. So if we look at the picture here, we've got a box falling through uh, the sky. We've got 50 newtons of gravity, uh, gravity expressed as a force. And then we've got 30 newtons of air resistance, which is the opposite acting in the opposite direction to the gravity so all we do is we take the highest from the lowest and the number that we've got gives us the direction and the magnitude so we've got a vector quantity there so we've got 20 newtons pointing downwards so here we've got 50 minus 30 there we go 50 downwards 30 upwards 50 minus 30 leaves us 20 downwards So the, revolt, the resultant force here is 20 minus 20. So we've got 20 newtons of force going down. We've got 20 newtons of force going up. 20 minus 20 is zero. So nothing is going to happen. Now, what I'd like you to do, just in your heads for this one, try the following four examples. You don't, you don't have to write them down unless you want to. What is the resultant force each time? Remember, force is a vector quantity. So it will need a size and it will need a direction unless it is zero. This is a zero resultant force. Pause the video now and press play when you're ready to continue. So, what does all this tell us? Well, let's really break it down. What does the resultant force tell us about the motion of an object? Well, if the resultant force equals zero, the object will either remain still or it will stay at a constant speed. If the resultant force does not equal zero, it's either going to accelerate or there's going to be a change of direction. That is it. That is all there is to it. It's all about what the forces are. They are the resultant force either equals zero or it doesn't equal zero. If it equals zero, nothing's going to happen. There'll be no change. If it doesn't equal zero, something has to change. So this is Newton's first law. If the resultant force is zero, objects at rest stay at rest or objects that are moving keep moving at the same velocity. So for example here, this car has got 50 newtons of thrust, 50 newtons of air resistance in opposite directions. They're cancelling each other out. 50 minus 50 gives us zero. So if the car's not moving, it will stay stationary. It will not move. If the car is travelling at, say, 50 metres per second, the car will stay travelling at 50 metres per second because all of the forces are balanced. So... This just goes into the example a little bit more. Little recap, can you remember what's the difference between velocity and speed? See if you can get the gears turning in your heads. 
Okay, so we'll have a look at something else. Now, we call this tendency of objects to continue in their state of rest or motion when the resultant force is zero, we call it inertia. Okay, the greater the mass of an object, the greater the inertia. That means that more mass means more force is required to start or stop moving. So if you think about a tiny sailboat or a giant oil tanker that aren't moving, a small gust of wind will get the sailboat moving. But a lot more force will be required to move the oil tanker. That can be the same as when you get a car moving, that you need to start pushing a car. So which is the more difficult to push? A really heavy car or a little shopping trolley? It's to do with mass. So what I'd like you to do is press pause on the video now and complete task one. When you're ready to continue, press play. So now we're going to look at Newton's second law. Now this states, the acceleration of an object is proportional to the resultant force acting on it and inversely proportional to the mass of the object. Now that does quite sound, sound quite complicated. But let's break it down. All it actually really means is more force means more acceleration. And it means more mass means less acceleration. That is it. Now, as it's physics, we have an equation. So the relationship is represented by the equation force in newtons is equal to mass in kilograms times acceleration meters per second squared. Give it the shorthand, F equals MA. Now I've colour coded this while we go through these examples to help you pick out the things that you need. Remember, writing your units and identifying the units helps you pick out the information. So question one, if a car has a mass of 1500 kilograms, what force is required to accelerate at 1.6 meters per second squared? So First thing we're going to do, let's identify our uh, information that we need. We've got mass, 1500 kilograms. We've got acceleration, 1.6 meters per second squared. Now we're going to write the equation we need. Force equals mass times acceleration. Then we're just going to plug our numbers in. Force is equal to 1500 times 1 1.6, which gives us the answer, 2400 newtons. Remember, force is always in newtons. Nice and easy. So let's go on to a little bit of something more difficult. So, what is the acceleration of a 10 kilogram object pushed by a 20 newton force? So this is a formula rearrange on this one. So, we're going to go through the same process again. We're going to write down our information, like so. So mass is 10 kilograms, force is 20 newtons. There we go, 10 kilograms, 10 kilograms, 20 newtons, 20 newtons. Our equation, we know the base equation is force equals mass times acceleration. So if we rearrange to make acceleration the subject, we know it will be force divided by mass. Let's plug our numbers in. Acceleration equals 20, which is our force, divided by 10, which is our mass. Gives you an acceleration of 2 meters per second squared. Nice and easy. Follow these steps. If you follow these, and they may seem simple now, but later on in your academic career, they will come in handy for you. So we'll do one more. If a dog is accelerating at 12 meters per second squared and has a force of 30 newtons, what is the mass of the dog? So we're going to go down the same process again. We're going to write down the information that we know. We're going to uh, identify the equation we're going to use, and then we're going to plug our numbers in. So acceleration, 12 meters per second squared. There we go, 12 meters per second, 12 meters per second. Force, 30 newtons, force, 30 newtons. Let's write down the equation that we need. So we know our base equation is force equals mass times acceleration. We're going to rearrange to make mass the subject of our equation. So we've got now mass equals force divided by acceleration. Plug our numbers in. So we know the mass is going to be equal to 30 divided by 12, which gives us 2.5 kilograms. Nice and easy. Follow it step by step. Now, on your exam questions, if you want to highlight the information to help you, do it. No one's going to stop you. You're not going to lose marks for that. It's all a process of picking out the information you need to answer the question. We will do one more. So, a car's engine applies a force of 3,000 newtons and its mass is 1,500 kilograms. The frictional force of 500 newtons is also acting on the car. So, calculate the acceleration of the car. Now, this is a two-step uh, answer. So what we need to do first is calculate the resultant force of the car using the force from the engine and the force from friction. So if we know we've got um, 3,000 in thrust and 500 in friction, 
we need to work out our resultant force, so we'll go through it. Force is going to be 3,000, our highest, minus 500, our lowest, which gives us 2,500 newtons of thrust acting forwards on the car. Remember, force is a vector, it needs a magnitude and it needs a direction. Now, we could complete the question by using the force equals mass times acceleration, which we will need to rearrange. Again, we're going to put our information in. We know our force is now 2,500 newtons. We know our mass is 1,500 kilograms. It tells us in the question. Let's rearrange our equation. The base equation is force equals mass times acceleration. Let's make acceleration the subject. So that becomes force divided by mass. Plug our numbers in. Acceleration is equal to 2,500. That's our force. Divided by... 1500, that's our mass, gives us an acceleration of 1.67 meters per second squared. So we know the car is accelerating at a rate of 1.67 meters per second squared. If the force was the other way around and the 3000 was going uh, in terms of friction and the 500 was forward thrust, well, then the car would be decelerating at a rate of 1.67 meters per second squared. Okay, this is where the vector part, the direction part of the vector, is important. So, what I'd like you to do, stop and complete the questions on the worksheet. Uh, it's labelled up as task two, and it's all to do with Newton's second law. Remember to go through the steps that we've done. Identify the information, write down the equation you're going to use, rearrange if you need to, plug your units in, and then calculate. Remember, always check your units. A lot of the examiners like to try and trick you by not including the units, and you can lose marks for simply just not writing the correct units. When you're ready to carry on, press play. So now what we're going to look at is Newton's third law. So this basically states that when two objects interact, the forces acting on one another are always equal and not opposite. So this means that forces act in pairs. If an object exerts a force on another object, the second exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. Sounds really complicated, but again, it isn't. So Newton's third law explains how a rocket on a launch pad is fired into space. So we've got a picture of the rocket there. And as you can see in my background, I've got the picture of the SpaceX. So we've got our force diagrams uh, with our arrows. Really, this should be the other way around, but never mind. So when the engine fires, the gas is pushed out the bottom of the rocket at a high speed. This is balanced by an equal and opposite reaction force. It is this reaction force that we call thrust that causes the rocket to accelerate. Apply a thrust at a force downwards, which means that the rocket lifts upwards. Now we can look at it in a different way. Think about Batman punching a criminal. If Batman punches with a force of 100 newtons, there will be an opposing force back onto Batman of 100 newtons as well. If there wasn't an opposing force, then there would be nothing to stop his hand going straight through the criminal. When you hit something, or when you bang your hand, it's the opposing force that causes the pain. Obviously, the biology side of it is how your brain recognises the pain. It's the physics that is the cause of the pain in the first place. So, there you have it. That is Newton's three laws of motion. They explain the relationship between objects, forces and motion. They are not complicated. You see them every single day. Newton went and put the signs behind them. And what he did is he helped he used them to help explain the motion of the planets around the sun. Now, back in those days... That was hugely controversial because we thought that the Earth was the centre of the universe. Now, so uh, what I'd like you to do, you're going to read through the diagram on the next page, which is kind of like a flowchart to help you. Um, if you need any further help, you can go back in the PowerPoint or if you're watching the video version, go back to the rewind it to the points that you need uh, and have another look at the examples that we've gone through. So here's our flowchart. So we've got our Newton's laws of free motion, Newton's first, inertia. There we go. Newton's second, um, basically it is forces equal to mass times acceleration, and then Newton's third, which is known as action and reaction. The old phrase, for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, this is where that phrase comes from, Newton's third. So, now you can try and answer the rest of the questions on the worksheet. Now, they get progressively harder. Um, go as far as you can. Remember, I don't mind mistakes. This is how I can pick things up. Looking at all your previous work, I know the maths is not an issue at all. What we need to work on now is picking out the information we need to answer the questions, okay? Uh, as ever, any problems, please feel free to give me an email uh, and I'll help where I can. Good luck and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.